By the turn of the 20th century, addiction was emerging as a major concern across the world. It had always existed, but the growth of international trade in recent centuries certainly saw new substances proliferate around the world. Tobacco had spread through Europe, for example, in the 18th century, but there was no doubt the 19th century had seen more addictive and dangerous substances emerge. Each country had its own particular vice. By 1900, the United States was in the midst of an opioid epidemic with an estimated one in every 200 people hooked on the drug. In Ireland, however, the problem remained a much older addiction, one that had plagued society for centuries, alcohol. While the Irish propensity for alcohol consumption had been a concern for centuries, it certainly appeared to be getting worse over the course of the 19th century. A government commission in the 1890s pointed to the Great Hunger as a pivotal moment, while a mass movement which campaigned against drinking alcohol enjoyed remarkable successes in the years before the onset of the famine in 1845, the decades afterwards had seen this trend reversed. That government commission on the sale of intoxicating liquors from the 1890s attributed this increased drinking, in part at least, to the trauma of the Great Hunger. Whatever the cause, the statistics were certainly startling. The number of pubs, an admittedly crude measure of alcohol consumption, were rising at an extraordinary rate. Between 1865 and 1896, even though the population of Ireland had fallen by over 20%, the number of pubs had increased by 12%. By 1896, there was 17,300 pubs on the island of Ireland. Now, while this suggests Irish people were drinking at an increased rate, other stats supported the idea that this alcohol consumption was becoming a major problem for wider society. In the decade either side of the year 1900, alcohol-related crime represented about 40%, yes, that's 40% of all prison sentences handed down in Irish courts. Yet staggering as these statistics may be, they say very little about the reality of alcohol addiction at the turn of the 20th century in this country. Not everyone who frequented those 17,300 pubs was an alcoholic. Most people were able to drink in moderation. Yet alcohol was a major problem, both in the way it destroyed lives, but also in the way that the government of the day handled us. Now to truly understand addiction in Irish society at the turn of the 20th century, this episode will focus on the life of one woman, a native of County Sligo called Sarah Garvey, who saw her own life and the lives of many in her community destroyed by alcohol addiction. We'll also look at how the government intervened with pretty bizarre solutions to what many considered to be an epidemic plaguing Irish society at the time. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire. Now, since we last spoke, my new book, A Lethal Legacy, A History of Ireland in 18 Murders, was launched. The book launch, which took place in Dublin on the 14th of September, was a lovely event. Thanks to everyone who came. I didn't get a chance to chat to all of you, but I have to give a special mention to the listener who had only arrived in from Canada, but came down. I have a second launch taking place in Waterford on Friday the 29th at 6.30pm in the Book Centre on Red Square. It's a really amazing bookshop. It's built into an art deco cinema from the 1930s and it's an amazing space, so I'm really looking forward to that. If you are in the southeast, do pop in. There will be signed copies available on the night. If you can't make that, the book is now on sale pretty much everywhere. There is a bit of a delay on the US release, so if you're buying it from within the US, try and find Irish sellers. Many of them do ship across the Atlantic. You can also buy it as an ebook, a Kindle, or the audiobook, which is narrated by myself, for an immediate download if you don't want to wait. Now, let's move on to today's show. The focus of the episode, a woman called Sarah Garvey, was actually due to be included in my book, A Lethal Legacy, A History of Ireland and 18 Murders, in a very different context to today's show. Her mention in the book had nothing actually to do with addiction, but after that was edited out, I wanted to explore more about this aspect of her life which leads to today's episode, and I think it's a pretty fascinating look at a group of people generally written out of the historical record. Before we kick off, 
The sound on today's episode is by Kate Dunley. And finally, just a quick heads up, there is a reference to sexual assault and physical abuse in the episode. When the Sligo woman, Mary Mulligan, went into labour in February 1865, her surroundings were far from ideal. Giving birth in the infirmary of the local workhouse left her surrounded by a range of patients, from women in childbirth like Mary, to those suffering from mental illness all the way through to the elderly who were infirmed. Nevertheless, it was in this noisy, chaotic and far from hygienic environment that Mary gave birth to a baby girl on February the 19th. It was no surprise that she didn't delay in the first ritual of life, that of baptism. This would take place almost immediately after the birth, a move motivated by the levels of high infant mortality at the time. Now, despite the dangers posed to her young life, the girl, named Sarah, survived the travails of her early days in the workhouse. While little is known about her childhood, the first 20 years, though, cannot have been easy for Sarah. Her father, Martin, was a casual labourer, and the later decades of the 19th century were a time of deep economic instability. An economic crash in the late 1870s combined with a failed harvest in 1879 even saw the spectre of famine return to the west of Ireland. Sarah endured these hardships and in the late 1880s entered the historical record in the first major ritual of adult life in 19th century Ireland, marriage. Her choice of husband, if it was her choice, was somewhat unusual however, In 1887, she married her neighbour, William Garvey, and while the two made a lightly match given they had grown up close to each other on Pound Street in Sligo, the fact that Sarah, at 22, was four years older than William may have surprised some. That said, the image of William preserved in local records certainly paints a striking picture and perhaps explains why Sarah would have been drawn to the man. He was tall for the time, standing at five foot nine inches, with brown hair, matching eyes and a fair complexion. He was also known to wear rings on each hand and would eventually have a tattoo between his thumb and forefinger. Whether this had drawn Sarah to the teenager or the marriage had been arranged, the wedding was the first in a series of events that would transform her life. From the earliest days of their marriage, it was clear that this young couple would face a hard and difficult life. Opportunities in late 19th century Sligo were limited. Emigration remained the major industry in the northwest of Ireland through the closing years of the century. Indeed, the rate of emigration and population decline was staggering. In 1841, County Sligo had been home to 180,000 people, but this had halved by 1891. While the sharpest decline took place during the Great Hunger of the 1840s, a continued exodus had taken place over the following decades. While the birth of Sarah's first daughter, Mary Ellen, nine months after her marriage, somewhat anchored her to Sligo, it was no surprise that her husband William did leave, temporarily at least, to earn a living. Following in the footsteps of his own father and uncle, he enlisted in the Connacht Rangers, a regiment of the British Army, where he would enjoy a brief but colourful military career. Within a few months, he had been incapacitated out of the army, However, on his return home to Sligo, William had no tale of military glory on the battlefield. His injury of sorts had been sustained in the bedroom. His complaint was venereal disease, something which can't have pleased Sarah when he arrived home. The British Army, for their part, it would seem, were happy to see the back of the man they would describe as an incorrigible and worthless soldier. Back in Sligo, William appears to have found work on the docks, But by the final months of 1891, he had begun drinking, which led to two arrests in November of the year for being drunk and disorderly in public. In the following years, William, who had been a dubious soldier, emerged as a worse husband. His drinking became increasingly problematic. He was regularly arrested for being drunk. And as we shall see, this created major problems for Sarah. Sarah, for her part, lived if the historical record is anything to go by, a quiet yet busy life in these years. She had appeared before the courts once in 1894, but her time was taken up rearing the five children she had given birth to. The late 1890s, however, appears to have been a turning point of sorts, and perhaps given modern understandings of addiction, it goes a long way to explain her later life. From the late 1890s onwards, 
Sarah Garvey herself began drinking to excess, appearing before the courts on a frequent basis and even serving short prison sentences. As a poor woman, we have no diary or personal account as to what happened in her life to explain what was a pretty dramatic change that took place in her early 30s. However, newspapers and court records point to the late 1890s as being a very difficult time in her life. On the 18th of March 1897, the day after St. Patrick's Day, she suffered a very serious assault at the hands of a neighbour, Thomas Downs, when he was drunk. Even the circumspect language of the time left little doubt as to what had happened when a court heard how Downs had, and I quote, forced his presence on her in a disgusting manner. What must have made things even worse was that other neighbours had witnessed the assault, but rather than intervene, they had turned away and gone into their homes. Alongside this assault, Sarah was also suffering physical abuse from her husband William when he was drunk, which appears to have been on a pretty regular basis. He was arrested on no less than seven occasions in 1897 for being drunk in public. The domestic abuse became such a serious problem for Sarah that she initiated legal proceedings against William for assault in 1895 and 1897. This was a strategy employed by women at the time who hoped that by taking a case and often dropping it at the last minute, the attention drawn to the issue would curb the abuse. This is precisely what Sarah did in 1898. When the case came before the courts that October, she stated clearly she did not want her husband William punished, but wanted the judge to make him take a pledge to stop drinking, because in her words, he was good to her when he was sober. The judge ignored her. William was sent to prison and didn't stop drinking. Under the severe personal strain these incidents must have inflicted on Sarah, it seems that it was around this time that she began drinking herself. By October 1897, she had been before the courts on a few occasions that year and told the judge she would take a pledge to stop drinking, indicating it was the source of her wayward behaviour. If she did make such a pledge, it doesn't appear to have lasted very long. In 1899, she was sent to prison for a week for riotous behaviour. There was no reference to her being drunk on this occasion, but in the following years she appeared before the courts on a frequent basis. Sometimes there was explicit references to alcohol, on other occasions it wasn't mentioned. But given these trials usually revolved around public order offences, it does seem likely that alcohol was playing an increasing role in what was an ever more chaotic life. Indeed, her own drinking was not the only problem Sarah had to contend with. While she had been assaulted by her neighbour Thomas Downs, and her husband William. In 1902, she was stabbed by another neighbour, a man called Dan Carr, when he was drunk. This led to a very humiliating day for Sarah before the local court. While she tried to bring a case against Carr, her husband William tried to settle the matter privately with her assailant in return for money. This led to a highly public squabble between Sarah and William in the court, where he desperately tried to prevent her from prosecuting Dan Carr, who had stabbed her fearing he would lose the compensation he had received. Eventually, Sarah would drop this case, because in her words, she would have no peace from her husband. The local press showed her no sympathy. They frequently referred to Cranmore Road, where she and William Garvey now lived in a mocking tone as an aristocratic neighbourhood, and continuing the analogy referred to William as Sarah's lord and master. In the coming years, Sarah would frequently find herself before the courts for being drunk in public, fighting with her neighbours and assault. Indeed, military and court records reveal how the Garvey household began to break up amidst this chaotic environment. In 1914, her son, Michael, perhaps in a bid to escape the situation, joined the Connacht Rangers at the outset of the First World War. Then, in 1915, two of her daughters, Elizabeth and Winifred, were both convicted of stealing. This would lead to the 12-year-old Winifred being removed from the Garvey family home and placed in an industrial school in Westport, County Mayo. Industrial schools were institutions where wayward children were sent, supposedly to be reformed. However, the reality was often that the children were treated appallingly and subjected to horrific abuse. This removal of Winifred from the family home appears to have had a major impact on Sarah and her drinking took on a level previously unseen. A policeman would later inform a local court that Sarah, now 50, hadn't been seen sober in three weeks in later September 1915. By this point, Sarah herself was clearly a chronic alcoholic. However, even if she wanted help, 
there were very few supports she could find. While the authorities of the day frequently railed against alcoholism and its impact, the solutions that they offered were generally ineffective. As we'll see, they did invest considerable resources on what were often bizarre and pointless solutions. Through her 30s and 40s, Sarah Garvey's life had been heavily shaped by her own addiction and the problematic drinking of others around her. However, there was little understanding of addiction or alcoholism at the time. The dominant view, held by most, claimed that addiction was a moral failing on Sarah's own behalf. And this was particularly the case for women who were held to a higher standard than men. For example, in 1911, when Sarah was sent to prison for fighting with a neighbour, a policeman in the court actually took pity on her husband and went as far as to say, only for her, William Garvey would never be in trouble. This only makes sense if Sarah is being held to a different standard than William, given his wayward behaviour long predated hers. In terms of wider attitudes to alcoholism, the government tackled the issue by adopting a blanket approach to drinking that had very little impact. At the start of the show, I mentioned some staggering statistics regarding the number of pubs in Ireland at the turn of the 20th century, some 17,300. That's a pub for around every 257 people, men, women and children, on the island. However, this statistic is misrepresentative and somewhat misleading. The reality was, of course, that every man, woman and child did not frequent these pubs. Children, one of the largest cohorts of the population at the time, by and large, did not consume alcohol. Women also didn't enter pubs either, at the same numbers as men. Even within the remainder of the population, though, there was a sizable element who didn't drink at all. By 1914, the membership of the Pioneer Total Abstinence Association, who took a pledge not to consume alcohol, stood at 280,000 people. There was also then, alongside these people, those who drank in moderation. This, therefore, left a small section of the Irish population, people like William and her husband Sarah, who were addicts. However, rather than tackle this group and their needs, the government employed an ineffective strategy that disproportionately targeted working-class drinking. This saw a series of laws introduced that made it illegal to be drunk in public. When people were arrested for being drunk in public, which they were by the thousand every year, they were taken before the courts and prosecuted. If they couldn't afford fines, they ended up serving short prison sentences. This explains how, for example, over 9,000 of the 26,500 prison sentences handed down in the year 1911 were alcohol-related. It is worth bearing in mind that that is not 9,000 individuals, but rather 9,000 cases. So some addicts, like Sarah, for example, could serve several sentences in the one year. This legislation, however, had terrible consequences. Alcoholics weren't the only ones prosecuted. Anyone found in public was liable to find themselves before the courts. In the early 1890s, a woman actually died from heart failure in Castlebar Jail after she was sent to prison for seven days for being drunk in public at the age of 70. The fact that this was her first time in prison in her entire life had a bearing on her death. On the opposite end of the scale, for the people who did need help, people like Sarah Garvey, it had no impact. Although she was repeatedly imprisoned for various offences, Sarah continued to drink and break the law regardless. Indeed, the authorities themselves admitted the ineffective nature of this approach. The 1901 report of the General Prisons Board labelled the jailing of drunks with short spells in prison as hopeless and useless as a wider solution. There were some more progressively minded approaches. For example, those who could afford them could go to clinics that claimed to be able to cure addiction. While their approaches were dubious by modern understandings, this was, in any case, far beyond the resources of someone like Sarah Garvey. There was a state-run reformatory established in Ennis, County Clare, in an old prison. This was a jail of a kind where judges could send what were called habitual drunkards. The ethos in the institution was focused on helping addicts, however, it had a minuscule impact. While its strategies and treatments were questionable at the best of times, its capacity was tiny. Only a few hundred people were ever treated there, and Sarah Garvey was not among them. This left her to languish in a chaotic life condemned by wider society, unwilling to tackle some of the underlying factors like abuse and poverty that at the very least made her condition worse. In 
The final years of Sarah Garvey's life continued along the same track as they had been since the 1890s. While there was much about Sarah's circumstances that would elicit sympathy, some of her actions had terrible consequences for others. For example, in November 1915, she and her daughter Mary Ellen were charged with a very serious assault on one of her neighbours. Sarah had punched Jane Macdonough in the face and Mary Ellen had beat her with a teapot. A week after the case went to trial, Sarah then assaulted another neighbour, Mary Ann Kelly, presumably because she had had the temerity to testify in the Jane Macdonough case. On that occasion, Sarah would rip out a clump of Kelly's hair. For this, she received a month in prison and was bound to the peace for a year. In July 1917, she was back before the courts after being arrested fighting again, this time in front of the Franciscan friary in Sligo with another woman. The local press again sneered at her misfortune, labelling Sarah as a female pugilist, a term used to describe a professional boxer. In these years, her husband William was, as he had always been, no support at all. He had had a roving eye since his own days in the army, and around this time he had a child with another woman. I only found reference to this daughter, Angela, on a subsequent military record after William re-enlisted in the British Army in August 1918 in the later stages of the First World War. Now his re-enlistment was no reflection that William was a changed character since his first stint in the army back in the 1890s when he had been described as a worthless soldier. By 1918, the British Army were in the midst of a manpower crisis and willing to take pretty much anyone. However, even in this situation, William was not let near the front. Instead, he served as a cook. Back home in Sligo, Sarah's life continued much as it had always had. In what would prove to be one of her final forays before the courts, she was involved in a political skirmish of a kind that took place to the backdrop of the growing revolutionary situation developing in Ireland in the later stages of World War I. Now Sarah had strong views on the political situation in Ireland given her familial connections to the British Army. Her son Michael, who I mentioned earlier, had enlisted in 1914, had actually been killed fighting in the Middle East in 1916. Her husband William had also re-enlisted, as we've just heard, while her brother-in-law John and father-in-law, also called Michael, had also served in the British Army at one point or another. This would leave Sarah with a deep resentment of the Republican movement who were critics of World War I, the British Army and the Irishmen who served. On December the 14th, 1918, the day of a pivotal general election across the United Kingdom, Sarah, her daughter Lizzie and another friend, Bridget McLaughlin, would attack a group of young Republicans in the streets of Sligo by shouting insults and throwing rocks at them. A Royal Irish Constabulary Officer, Timothy Murphy, emerged from a nearby barracks and arrested the women in time to prevent a major melee. Whether she was drunk on this occasion is unclear, but so profane were Sarah's words towards the Republicans that the police constable would later refuse to repeat them in open court, instead passing them in writing to the judge. She received a somewhat lenient sentence at the hearing which took place two weeks later, on December the 28th. The judge would put the case back for three months, but warned Sarah and her co-accused to abide by the law in that time. However, within six weeks, in February 1919, Sarah was back before the courts, this time facing an eviction. The cause, however, was her own antisocial behaviour. While she paid the rent on time, she was described as being loud, having a bad tongue and a general nuisance to her neighbours, a complaint that she had faced regularly over the previous 20 years. William, her husband, who was on home on leave from the army, accompanied her to the court hearing in uniform in the hope that this might elicit sympathy, but Sarah's threat to kill the landlord did little to help the situation. This was hardly abiding by the law which the judge in her previous case had ordered her to do. However, before she could face the courts again, history interceded. In early February 1919, Sarah had started to feel unwell. In the following days, these symptoms developed into a sore throat, chills and fever. This was what were becoming the well-recognised early symptoms of the Spanish flu, the pandemic sweeping across the world in the aftermath of the First World War. Given the toll alcohol and addiction had taken on her body, Sarah struggled to fend off the disease and a week after showing her initial symptoms, she died on February the 11th, one of the 23,000 Irish fatalities in the pandemic. 
While her death record claimed she was 45, she was in fact eight days short of her 54th birthday. Tragic as her life, and indeed death, was, it's difficult to imagine Sarah Garvey's passing elicited much sympathy in her native Sligo. She had lived and died on the margins of society. She had been a regular fixture before the local courts with a litany of charges that stretched all the way back into the 1890s. However, surely some recognised that she was not solely the architect of her own downfall. Life had dealt Sarah a very rough hand. She was married to an abusive alcoholic. Her life had spiralled out of control in the late 1890s after she had suffered a very serious assault. With no support or intervention, her life revealed the reality of addiction in early 20th century Ireland, a far cry from the glamorised Irish drinker who entertains the crowd. It was one of violence, misery and a life ruined by addiction. While the British withdrawal from the 26 southern and western counties of Ireland would begin two years after Sarah's death, little to nothing changed in terms of the way alcohol and addiction was viewed in Ireland after independence. It remained a major problem as the powers that be refused to tackle its causes. Her husband William was a case in point. After Sarah's death, he was discharged from the army in the spring of 1919 and returned home to Sligo. However, he continued to live much as he had over the previous three decades. He remained a chronic alcoholic and a regular fixture before the local courts with no effective solutions or treatments available. Somewhat remarkably, given the life he had lived, he survived well into his 80s and only died in the 1940s. That's where I'm going to end this show. That's the last of the episodes based on research that didn't make it into A Lethal Legacy, A History of Ireland in 18 Murders. Next week's show is on something completely different. It's the story of the Erigna Soviet, a fascinating history from the Irish Revolution. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>